Welcome to the shooting show. This week we're in the heart of Africa hunting dangerous game on the Cherby River. Byron Pace takes up the story. Venturing into the heart of Africa, sporting rifles, Byron Pace joins friends and professional hunters, Lano and Elaine, en route to Namibia's Caprivi Strip. The brother and sister team are guiding clients after hippo and crocodile across the swollen floodplains of the Chobe. It promises to be a challenging but exciting trip. After a day on the road and five hours afloat, they finally arrive at camp ready for the following week's safari. But before a good night's sleep could be had, an important rundown on shot placement for these two tricky and dangerous animals had to be given. Lano speaks to the group. Tomorrow morning we'll give you the details just now. Just about the hippo and the crocodile. And I'm going to show you the DVD, the perfect shot now, just to give you a broader idea. Um, the hippo and the crocodile, both of them, we're going to come very close, okay? So for the hippo, we're going to use solids. Skin is very thick, all right? And once again, please, we must try to aim precisely. Hippo is the animal that takes the most life in, Af life in Africa every year, okay? It's, it's even more dangerous than buffalo and lion, okay? So you shoot, the pH is going to shoot immediately, and by the time the pH shot is dead, you must be ready to take your second shot, okay? Um, and we're not going to stop shooting until the hippo is dead. It's five to seven in the morning, day one, Namibia in the Caprivi Strip. I've uh, left Mr. Carr hunting rodeo back in the UK, but I'm here hunting hippo and crocodile with three clients from the Czech Republic. The scenery from uh, where we're staying is just absolutely stunning. We still need to go and uh, just quickly check the rifles for uh, the solids and, and soft points that they're going to be using for the hunt um, over the next week. Go and find the game scouts and uh, then head out for hippo number one. Setting off on day one, everyone is filled with anticipation as the adventure begins. Hunting across the submerged floodplains is very different to the environment most hunters are used to. This is conservation in action. The hippo population here is doing very well and hunting quarters are tightly controlled to benefit both the species and its impact on the environment. This morning we went out with a platoon boat on the main streams looking for crocodile and for hippo. We saw that nice big bull that we saw yesterday. Um, unfortunately it was in one of the main streams. The currents are very strong. We don't want to shoot it in the strong current because then we might have never find it. Uh, on our way back to the lodge for lunch, we found a, a nice hippo lying down. Almost got excited, thought it was a bull. But once you stand up, we saw it was a cow and we left it to go. And then after lunch, we got into this uh, banana boat, the modern version of a Makoro. And uh, now we're going through the, the flat plains into the small kennels to see if we can find anything, but nothing yet. The day comes to an end. The hunters have covered a vast area and seen good numbers of hippo, but not had the opportunity to lift a rifle on this occasion. Their time was not wasted though, as Lano and Elaine now have a good feel for the area. Under a cold morning sunrise, the hunters set off across the water once again. Quickly they spot a pod of hippo behind some reeds not far from camp. Could this be the first opportunity for a bull? There he is. It was decided before the hunt began that Martin would be first up on the rifle. Right at the back. Right at the back. He's f facing that way. Okay. And you see the eyes and the, and the ears? There is. You see that one? Okay, the one, the one that's uh, with a bird, yeah, with a bird, yes, 
When you're ready, shoot. With a little help from nature, the correct animal is identified. It's an old bull and the perfect animal to take as part of the management call. From his elevated shooting position, Martin was able to take a safe shot, avoiding the rest of the pod. Well done, my friend. Nice shooting. Okay. Right, get down, get down. Get off. Okay. After waiting for the stomach gases to ferment and float the carcass, Lano and Elaine set about roping the bull ready to tow into shore. This is the only way to get the much needed meat to the nearest village. Moving two and a half tons of dead weight is no easy task. It is very much a collaborative effort and finally they managed to get the mighty animal on the move. Martin has taken a perfect shot. The brain is between the eye and the ear. And you can see where his shot was. So it was uh, dropped it at the point. And that was a perfect shot from the side. If you shoot the hippo from the front, you can see it can make a, like a V here between the eyes. And your aiming point will be right between the eyes, just under that V. And with a, with a brain shot, you will drop it instantly and uh, your hippo is down. The site behind me is something I, I wish a lot of anti-hunting groups could see. And we've got uh, m more than 100 villagers lined up taking meat as a result of the, uh, the hunt that we've been on today, which is a, a vital source of um, protein for them. And not to mention the, the income that's generated through hunting in a remote area like this. Uh, we're right up in the, the north of Namibia on the border with uh, Botswana. Uh, there is, really isn't a lot uh, in the way of work up here. We, you've got tourism and you've got hunting. And that's pretty much about it. The rest is all subsistence living. Uh, you can see the, the amount of people that are, are being supported and you know, getting some benefit out of the, the hunting that's gone on today. We have uh, one very happy client in the boat. Uh, and uh, a lot of full bellies tonight. We've had a, a pretty successful day today. We've managed to bag one of the three hippos that we've come out here for. We're going to just finish up here, uh, pack up and get back to camp. I think probably a few drinks and celebration tonight will be the order of the day. And then up again early, first thing tomorrow morning, uh, go and try and, and, try and uh, fit in two hippos tomorrow. With one management bull already in the bag, the hunters head out to find the next suitable animal. Lano and Elaine take the group to a hidden channel. The pontoon boat is too heavy to move through the shallow water, so everyone transfers over to the banana boat, a much more suitable craft to tackle the reef beds. Red lays out the plan of attack. We've seen five really quite big hippo, uh, which included a very, very nice bull. Uh, but when the boat arrived, they got a little bit spooked and slipped off into the water. So what we've done now is we've come up the channel um, one, one and a half k's and we're just going to sit it out here in the shade uh, while they do their thing and hopefully come back out on the bank onto dry land. They look pretty keen to, to get back out the water and into the sun. We didn't want to hang around and force them uh, further into the, the reeds where we wouldn't be able to find them again. So um, let's, let's hope that the plan works. I mean, you're expecting a big bull to be two and a half, 2.6, 2.7 tons. That's a lot of hippo to get angry. Um, you don't really want to make any mistakes when you're hunting them. After watching the hippo surfacing in a secluded pool, Lano and Elaine prepare Milan to take the shot. There's very little surface time and it's a small target, but on land they are steady and comfortable. They can take their time. With both shots hitting the precise spot, they have successfully added another bull to the cool tally. It was late in the day, so the hunters would return in the morning once the hippo had floated. Then the whole butchering process would begin again. It's the group's final day in the Caprivi. They head down the mighty Cherby River itself, acting on information received via the bush telegraph. 
Apparently a big bull is currently lying up on a sand spit. Sure enough, they soon find the animal in question. It's a bull. It's a bull. The one, the one with the bird in front of him, yeah. With fast water a matter of metres away, it is essential the shot placement is perfect. You shoot and it doesn't, it's not in the water yet. Shoot again, okay. Keep on shooting until I tell you to stop. Okay. Hunting in Africa is not for the faint-hearted. To get into position, the group have to wade through croc-infested shallows. Everyone is a little tense. It wouldn't take much for everything to go badly wrong, and Africa is noted for catching out the unwary. Identifying the bull, Milan readies for his second hippo. Both the first shot and backup shot find their mark. The bull is down and the three permits made available in this concession have been filled. Next year they will survey the populations again and decide how many animals need to be taken for overall management policies. But for now, the job is done. Well for hippo hunting anyway, as Lano and Elaine still have three crocodiles to find. Byron there, once again living life on the edge. And now, from the dark continent to the shooting show news. This is the Shooting Show News. There is fresh doubt over the Badger Cull pilot in South West England. Last month, the High Court ruled in favour of the Cull, but the Badger Trust has now won the right to take the case for the Court of Appeal. The appeal is likely to be heard by the end of September, but it still means the start of the Cull may be delayed. Full story in the next issue of Modern Home Scottish National Heritage has told her walkers to check deer stalking info online before heading out. The Heading for the Scottish Hills website provides information on when and where stag stalking will take place on some of Scotland's most popular estates. The SNH said the site was a quick and easy way for walkers to check that they wouldn't disturb deer stalking. New statistics show that illegal poisonings of birds of prey in Scotland have fallen dramatically. Last year there were 10 confirmed poisonings, a 42% reduction from 2010. And in the first quarter of this year, there was only one confirmed illegal poisoning in Scotland. Read all about it in the next issue of Modern Game Theory. Sports Marketing's new black range of airgun ammo has taken the market by storm, selling over 2.5 million pellets in four weeks. Available in dome, flat and pointed head configurations, Pellets use graphite, like that found in pencils, to reduce friction in the barrel. Early test reports are very favourable, and you can see the full results in October's issue of Airgun Shooter. And finally, a shooting show news special. Play Shooting Magazine's Gabby Smith gets an exclusive interview with Olympic gold medalist Peter Wilson. First question, why did you get into shooting? I know you had the snowboarding accident. Why shooting? To be absolutely precise, I got into shooting when I was very, very young. I mean, I live on a farm and I, I had the opportunity to shoot, um, but never really took it up. And, uh, and it was only when I had this, this snowboarding accident that I did. I, I, I had the opportunity to play chess, to play tiddlywinks, and, and I worked out that I was completely useless at both. A friend of mine was shooting and he said, look, come along, have a go. If they'll allow you to shoot one-handed, then, um, then I'm sure you know, you, you'll enjoy it. I had, like I said, shot before, so I thought, yeah, go for it, we'll have, have some fun. Did that for six months with, with my arm in a sling. The other six months were, were sort of rehabilitation and the physios were really keen that I carry on anyway because I was holding the gun in my left arm and that was sort of naturally just, just uh, good for me and good for my, my recovery. And, uh, and really when I came back to full fitness, I went back to cricket, squash, sort of more mainstream sports and realised that I was even worse at them than when I started and decided that you know, enough was enough and I'll, I'll carry on with shooting. I shot then competitively for about four years uh, on the sporting scene and fit house scene and just really worked out that if I wanted to carry on professionally, uh, and not that I was at that time anyway, but if I wanted to kick off and, and take it up in, in a professional way, I'd watch Richard Folds win the Olympics in 2000 and realise that that was the only avenue. You have to go to the Olympic Games, you have to take it one step further. The run up to the Olympics, how has it been the last 
sort of however long it's been that you've been planning well, the Olympics? Well, I've been shooting now for six years. Uh, I wasn't good enough to, to compete in Beijing. I was, however, allowed to go as part of Ambition 2012, and that meant that I got a real experience, a real flavour for what the Olympics is all about. And if nothing else, that gives you that real driving force to commit and, and just push your, your body and your mind to the, to the absolute limit. And um, it's, it's a four-year process, and Ahmed and I have been working really, really hard on, on, on it. And Ahmed is certainly a, a very individual, very different, and has a, has a fascinating method to getting the information across and also working what we work on. When you're coming up to the final, you've got a pretty qualification with a brilliant score. How does that feel? It was good. I mean, if I'm honest, um, I'm really honest, it wasn't my best score. I, I was actually quite disappointed with my qualifying rounds. I would have been much happier with a couple more clays going in. Clearly, you know, any lead is obviously a great, a great mm -hmm. lead, but going into an Olympic final at home had, had a bit of pressure stuck to it. So um, I would have been happy with a few more. Uh, the final was, I mean, an amazing experience, I have to say. You know, altogether, that was just something that I'll, I'll live with for the rest of my life, and, and uh, it was just the most incredible experience. And you've obviously been asked to ask this a lot, but what did it feel like when you dropped those two targets? <laughs> it's not easy, you know. I, I said to myself, I, in fact, I, I, I dropped three in the run-up to, you know, run to it, and uh, by that stage I sort of got everything going. I was pretty happy with my shooting, very happy technically, <laughs> mentally, etc. I think I probably got a little bit ahead of myself. I think I started thinking maybe this is it, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm soon to be an Olympic gold medalist, and that's, that's, that's quite special at home. And that was really the only thing I put that, that, that attribute, that double miss, down to. And, uh, and that's, that wasn't something that I was too fussed about, if I'm honest, because it's just a mental tweak. I allowed myself to look at the board when we went to pass peg three, so I had two pairs to go. I realized I had a lead. I hit the pair, running up to peg five, I realized this is it. This is the Olympic Games. I thought about double barreling the first one, and that only really was for about a second, but it's something that does go through your head when you realize the importance of this competition. And I thought, this is it, let's just do this, let's get this done, let's finish this job off and let's just go home and play a bit of table tennis. So, uh, so I did, and I shot the pair. Read the full report on Wilson's win in the September issue of Play Shooting, out next week. Any farmer will tell you that the weather this year has been terrible, but it's not just crops that have been affected. Our wild game has been hit particularly hard. I travelled from my home glens in Angus to speak with sporting rifle writer Andy Malcolm about the upcoming grouse season. Last year was a really good year for grouse in Angus and across Scotland as a whole. What were the components that came together to make it so successful? Um, it's a combination of things. Um, for a start, a lot of places had good stock from the year before, uh, which you always need. But uh, on top of that, we had a, an excellent spring and uh, the grouse uh, nested very well. This year, that's not the case. By all accounts, it looks like grouse have really struggled. What is it that's hampered grouse survival so much? Well, um, again, we, we left good stock, perhaps too many, um, and it wasn't long after the shooting season last year that we started to see signs of, um, of disease in amongst our grouse, you know, Trisfunga worm infestation, and uh, that carried on through the winter. So uh, we lost quite a few birds to that, we think, and. Um, Coupled with that, we had a really lousy spring. We had a great march, which might have fooled us, the, the grouse into sort of nesting early. And then we had uh, foul weather for a long time, including snow uh, at the start of June. This damp, cold weather hasn't really helped things either, has it? Not at all, not at all. Especially if your, your hens are weak as well, uh, which might be the case if they have a high worm burden. Um, but the, the, the chicks need insect life uh, once they are hatched uh, and instead of getting you know warm weather good insect life to, to feed the, the chicks instead of that they were just getting drenched and cold and um, yeah it uh, did a lot of damage to the, to the stalks. Grouse as a game bird is highly prized is there anything that can be done to prevent problems like we've seen this year obviously the weather has been the major issue. That's right um, when it comes to the weather you, it can just undo a year of work what we can do about the, the worm infestation is um, the, the, the grouse take this grit. Uh, they take grit naturally uh, to help them uh, break down the food in their crops. And what we can do is we can provide gritting stations all over the hill. And on these gritting stations, we provide grit that is coated in medication that will kill off the worms in their gut. Um, but this will only work for the, the birds that take the grit. And um, furthermore, 
the, the ones that do take the grips, they can rein, um, get reinfected with worms really quite quickly afterwards. However, it's, it's, um, it's a pretty, uh, pretty accepted way of, of um, helping your, your grouse stalks now. Andy, obviously it's going to be very important that you don't shoot too many grouse, especially in a year like we've just had. What measures do you go through to make sure that you know exactly what's on your ground and what is possible to shoot so that you're still leaving a good breeding stock? Every keeper with his salt will have a good idea of uh, what grouse he has on his ground, but more importantly, you, you go out and do your July counts uh, where you, you go to set areas and you, you work those certain areas with dogs and um, you just record what you see. What you're not hoping to do is count every grouse on that bit of moor, but what you do is you get a, a sample and you can compare that number with, with what you've recorded previous years and you can work out just exactly what you can shoot and still conserve stocks for, for next year's breeding season. Next year, if we see similar weather patterns again, what is that going to mean for grouse stock? Similar weather pattern this year, well, it, it's, it just doesn't bode well at all. Um, what we are hoping is that um, our, our numbers are down so that uh, the, the disease won't be a problem. Um, but uh, if, if they don't nest well again, um, it, it bodes even worse because what will happen is our, our nesting stock will be getting older and there'll be no or little recruitment um, from the young coming up. So does that mean that the odd grouse moor could have to close for a season? Um, well, I mean, I, I've, I've, I've heard rumours that there are already places that have, have cancelled all shooting. And um, it's, it's a prudent move. If you're worried about your stocks, um, you don't shoot. And the, the, the places that uh, have got limited numbers will, will just be having a limited season. It's, it's just good management. That's it for this week. We're out every Monday, 7.30pm UK time. This is The Shooting Show.